All right, so we are honored to have our Health for the World International Grand Rounds speaker today, Dr. Uh, Edward Smitterman. Dr. Edward Smitterman is a board certified radiologist with expertise in musculoskeletal uh, imaging. His practices focuses on uses of radiographs, CT, MRI, and ultrasound to diagnose a variety of musculoskeletal related conditions caused by sports injuries, traumas, or tumors. He has received uh, multiple professional honors and recognition for his clinical excellence, teaching, and service. Prior to joining UC San Diego Health in 2014, Dr. Spitterman was an assistant professor of radiology at Yale School of Medicine. He completed a fellowship in musculoskeletal radiology at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, and a residency in diagnostic radiology at uh, Yale School of Medicine. He earned his medical degree from sunny upstate uh, medical university. We are honored to have uh, Dr. Smitterman as our uh, Grand Rounds um, speaker today. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. Smitterman, you can start the talk whenever, uh, whenever you're ready. Thank, you. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so uh, this is a very informal talk, just uh, uh, one of uh, hopefully my initial uh, talks that I'll be giving to you all. And if there's any other uh, topics just for future that uh, you would like to hear, please let me know. Uh, I may have them already, or I'd be happy to gather cases or uh, try to build talks for y'all and others to share. Uh, so today I was just asked to share a, this talk on uh, uh, basic lumbar and hip radiographs, sort of, I guess, my approach and some cases. So I've been asked <clears throat> uh, quite often what my uh, search pattern is, and to be honest, these days, it's it's more of uh, looking uh, gestaltly at the whole image, and what what I've tried to do is uh, distill it down to three basic things. If if I if press, uh, that is the ABCs of uh, basic uh, radiographs or bone radiographs. That is looking at alignment for the A, uh, the degree of bone mineralization, too much or too little. Okay, the B and the, uh, tracing out the cortices, or, or basically the, the C of the ABCs. But before we get into the cases, I uh, just wanted to share, uh, obviously, a normal frontal radiograph. And um, let's just go through and highlight some of the anatomy that uh, we should all be familiar with, or hopefully uh, more comfortable with uh, at the, by the time the end of this talk, OK? So here on this frontal radiograph, we can see just outline, and y'all can see my arrow, I presume? Yeah, okay, so so this obviously is the vertebral bodies, and in this case, this patient does have five uh, non-rivering lumbar type vertebral bodies. And then using the L2 vertebra, we can trace out the pedicles, or that is the start of the posterior elements of the vertebral bodies, and we should obviously have two pedicles per vertebral body. And each pedicle, or sorry, each vertebral body should also have a corresponding spinous process, or that is the most posterior elements of, uh, of uh, the vertebral uh, body. And obviously, the, if you can, you can hallucinate, or we can trace out also the arms of the vertebral bodies, or that is the transverse processes. So you want to make sure that all these lines and cortices line up. Okay, as you can see with the cortices, or sorry, with the spinous processes, as well as the uh, pedicles. Okay, if, if, if anything is out of alignment, then you, you're going to start to correlate with your history and worry about things, uh, maybe perhaps uh, trauma, uh, if a pedicle is out of place or a spinous process is out of place. If there's an absent pedicle, things to worry about would be uh, mesaic disease or myeloma, which we'll kind of uh, talk about in a bit. Uh, but those are some, some of the things that you want to look for on a frontal x-ray of uh, the lumbar spine. Now, moving to a, 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 a lateral view, okay, we could do this a similar thing, okay, and this obviously would be the body or the vertebral body. The pedicles, or that is the eyes of the vertebral bodies on either, uh, obviously this is a, a summation of shadows, so we're just going to see uh, the uh, one or the lateral view of the eyes here. Here is the, the superior and inferior articular of the sets. Okay, and then obviously here, the previously shown as the nose, but on the lateral view here, this is going to be the uh, 
the spinous process of the uh, vertebral bodies, okay? So I, I like to sh show this slide. This is uh, a game that uh, I play with my kids and, and, a, and a, a game that I learned growing up. But this is uh, what's called a highlight, the, uh, the, uh, the difference between two images. And so when you order or when we get uh, images, uh, some of the best cases that I have that I learned from, uh, of some, from some of my mentors is to have uh, a nice uh, case log of normals. So uh, if you learn what normal looks like, then you can start to pick up what abnormal looks like <clears throat> when, uh, when it's presented to you. And if you have a normal picture in mind, Let's take the left image, the, sorry, the, the photograph of uh, the sushi bar on the left. If, that, if you take that as your normal, then you compare it with your abnormal uh, image and you can start to pick out the differences. For instance, in the abnormal image on the right, if you will, uh, you can see the absence of this piece of sushi at the top, uh, top hand image or top end of the image right here. You can see a, a piece of, uh, I guess, steak or tuna missing here, okay? And we can go on and on. You can see a, someone's eating the piece of sushi down here at the bottom uh, of this uh, image on the right there. So I encourage you to uh, try out uh, maybe, you know, at the beginning of the day or have a, a normal uh, case log uh, of uh, uh, normal radiographs so that you know uh, you know, if you catch something, a normal variant, let's say, or pathology, then sometimes it, it, it helps to have a, a control, if you will, to, uh, to reset your eyes to, uh, to better help, better catch pathology and hopefully help uh, some of our patients. So diving right into the cases, and what I've tried to do is highlight uh, or share in a similar fashion normal anatomy on the left and uh, the pathology or cases or diseases, if you will, on the right. So starting with this case, we can, and the history on this case was, was back pain. Um, and as we can see here, starting with the A's and the ABCs, the alignment, just tracing the alignment, the posterior vertebral body line, you trace it all the way down, you have a step off between presumed here L, L5 and S1 right here. And if you notice, there's a lucency here at the inter uh, articularis region of the pars, or that is the uh, pars defect. If we obviously get, uh, so this is a case of uh, pars defect causing spondylolisthesis of L5 on S1. Um, so obviously this is, there are many types of uh, uh, spondylolisthesis, uh, but the main uh, the main thought is that this is due to uh, either uh, chronic trauma or, uh, uh, or an acute event, but there are dysplastic and congenital, congenital variants, okay? But you want, what you want to look for, the key to di this diagnosis I mentioned earlier, is the alignment, or that is the A of the posterior vertebral body lines. And also notice here, the spinal lateral line or the spinous processes posteriorly are also out of alignment. And you, as you notice here at L5, you have a big jump off between presumed L posterior aspects of L4 and L5 spinous process respectively. Okay, so in this case of bilateral pars defects with spondylolisthesis. How about this case? So normal on the left, okay, and a patient presenting with back pain after a motor vehicle accident on the right. And as we look at our alignment, it's pretty good, but you'll notice that there's a subtle focal kyphosis centered at about T12L1. And if we go along uh, with our ABCs, if we go to the Cs, if we trace the cortices, this cord the cortices at L1 are obviously wedged anteriorly, and there's subtle okay, widening of this uh, uh, interspinous distance right here. And if I give you the history of motor, back pain after motor vehicle accident, one thing you're going to be worried about is a vertebral uh, body compression fracture, okay, specifically a chance type fracture in, in this case. As you can imagine, someone wearing or someone flexing over their uh, torso and abdomen, and if you can imagine the fulcrum is right here, you can imagine how uh, as the patient is uh, hyperflexed for, forward, this, this can lead 
to injuries of not only the vertebral bodies, but the posterior longitudinal complex. And these injuries are considered unstable and you want to fix these uh, injuries, okay? How, is this pace okay for everyone? Yeah? Hello? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So moving right along into the next case, uh, I apologize, I did not provide a normal uh, radiograph on, of, on the left of a normal vertebral body, but as you can see here, there is hyper, the alignment is good, or the a, that is the A. Okay, if you trace out the Cs, that's also good, but what stands out here in this case is the B, or that is the bone mineralization at the superior and inferior end plates of this cone down view of the lumbar spine. And what catches our eye, obviously, is this sclerosis, okay, and this sort of fuzzy or ill-defined appearance, if you will, of the superior and inferior end plates of the vertebral bodies. If now, <clears throat> if you look at the rest of the film and the answers, okay, are usually on the film, as my mentors like to uh, have taught me, you notice that this patient also has a densely calcified a uh, aorta, or that is atherosclerotic disease. And if, and if uh, you look even closer, you can see subchondral, subtle subchondral resorption, okay, at the facet joints, okay. So taken all together, and if I give you additional history, that this person's on long-term hemodialysis, okay, we get to what's called the uh, so-called rugger jersey spine, if you will, in this case, of renal osteodystrophy, okay, which is basically a, a, a a disease most commonly that we see now, not uh, uh, with diabetes causing uh, renal disease. And this basically is a, uh, a phosphate metabolism issue leading to these abnormal mineralization of bone os or osteomalacia and other findings that you can see with uh, uh, renal osteodystrophy, namely uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism, which leads to resorption of bone at various places, that is subchondral, or even at the tendon, tendon or ligamentous insertions upon bone, okay? So this nice case of rugged jersey spine with uh, causing, or that is renal osteodystrophy. If we juxtapose that or uh, compare that with this case, you could see here similar findings, but this more well-defined, and some people have actually argued that the sclerosis of these end plates touch the anterior and superior aspects of the vertebral bodies, okay? And if I, sh if I showed additional images, there's other sclerotic bones. Let's say we, I gave you a pelvic radiograph where there's a bone in bone appearance, or even an Erlenmeyer flask of the long bones. One, th one, th one thing that may uh, jog our memory or uh, what this finding has been like to is the sandwich vertebral bodies. Sort of similar, but on the differential for rugged jersey spine, but this is a case of alberg schoenberg disease, if, if you're into eponyms, or that is osteoporosis. But basically there's an imbalance of activity between osteoblasts and osteoplasts leading to similar findings to renal osteodystrophy, okay? Um, but, and you would think that being high, uh, sclerotic or hyperdense, the bone would be stronger, but in fact, the bone is more brittle. And these patients can fracture through this abnormal bone, if you will. Okay, so this is a case of osteoporosis, okay, or what's, what's known as albrecht schoenberg disease, leading to this so-called uh, uh, vertebral body sandwiches, or the sandwich vertebra sign, okay? And finally, to compare those, uh, those, pre those, three, those two previous diseases with this disease, okay, where you have, if you will, uh, a sort of picture frame and appearance of the vertebral bodies, okay, with thickened cortices, coarsened trabecula, and sort of expansile bones, okay, if you will. And if I told you that, obviously here, multiple, this is a polyostotic process, so multiple bones are involved, okay? But if I also told you that their various labs were out of, uh, lab parameters were abnormal, such as uh, ALFOS, which it is uh, a marker for bone turnover, Perhaps this person also has a cardiac output failure, but this is a case of Paget's disease or osteitis deformans, okay? Thought to be due, uh, the ideology is still unclear, but thought to be due perhaps to paramyxovirus infection and not as common, at, at least in, in my practice these days, but uh, typically the classic history is, is going to present in, uh, in uh, uh, Caucasian uh, 
uh, patients, but in this case, of, of uh, Paget's disease with picture frame appearance. Okay, so it's sort of to line up all, all three of those cases of abnormal bone mineralization, again, we have the uh, renal osteodystrophy with the so-called rugged jersey spine, very similar, okay, but more ill-defined here with the sandwich vertebrae with albrecht schirm disease or osteoporosis. And notice here in the picture frame appearance of Paget's disease, the anterior and posterior cort cortices are also thickened and, and uh, sclerotic and the course and trabecular, if you will, in this case of Paget's disease presenting with picture frame appearance. So those three diseases I show uh, or just oppose them for you, for everyone to appreciate here. How about this case? Okay, a history of uh, a patient with chronic back pain. Okay, and you can see, okay, the alignment on this cone down view of the lumbar spine is, is very good. Okay, the posterior and anterior uh, spinal lines all line up. The bone mineralization is a little bit heterogeneous, but what catches our eye here is the C of the ABCs, or that is, that is you trace out the cortices, okay? And what we can see here is what's been likened to H-shaped vertebral bodies or uh, fish mouth vertebral bodies, as you can see here. And this is a case of sickle cell disease um, causing uh, uh, bone infarction, or basically this blood dysgrasia causing bone infarcts at the end plates or the subchondral bone of the vertebral bodies leading to this H-shaped appearance of these uh, lumbar vertebral bodies, okay? Or how about this case, okay? New onset back pain, okay? And as we see here, if we go through our ABCs, right off the bat, right off, right, right off the bat, you can see that the A or the alignment anteriorly and even posteriorly is slightly off by a few millimeters. If we trace out the B, or if we look at bone mineralization, it looks pretty normal, okay? Maybe you can argue that there's some subtle sclerosis at the end plates of what is uh, L1 and L2 here. But what also catches our eyes if we do the our, if we do the C's of our ABCs that is, that is the cortices we can see that it's irregular and defined and arguably eroded okay and if we if we take anything at all from this uh, lecture okay anytime we have a monoarticular arthropathy okay a monoarticular arthropathy that is a, a jo single joint involvement the one of the one of the top one or two or three things that you want to exclude is infection infection infection. If I told you that this patient, um, this patient unfortunately was an IV drug user, okay, this is actually a case of spondylitis. There is a differential for this, which we'll sort of highlight in a bit, but anything, anytime you have a monoarticular arthropathy, you want to make sure to exclude infection. As you know, that can lead to accelerated osteoarthritis or degenerative changes. But worst case scenario, this patient, these patients can potentially become septic and very ill and uh, progressing to extremis. So something that you wanna keep on your, certainly on your differential for monotone arthropathy. Okay, so how about this case, okay? A bizarre looking case, okay, with expansile bones, okay, of multiple uh, uh, vertebral body levels, particularly at L2 and L3, okay? Um, and then to a lesser extent on the left-hand side of L4 and L5, I provide a, the corresponding CT, sagittal, sagittal CT images of the same patient. We can see the destruction, okay, centered at the L2 level and as well as the L4, L5 level. So this is just a case of chronic, okay, infection. I believe, uh, I don't remember the exact uh, uh, organism in this case, but this is a case of uh, chronic infection. As you, and as you can see, when the bones look, uh, for lack of a better term, altered or wonky, if you will, okay, one thing to certainly keep in mind, okay, is infection, uh, acute infection, but also chronic infection, okay? And in this case of chronic osteomyelitis, okay? And depending on obviously where you practice, whether uh, you wanna have your, uh, you wanna uh, tailor your, your antibiotics to, the, uh, the prevalent microorganisms that you are dealing with in your uh, area of practice. Let's say if you're practicing in, uh, in, uh, in Latin America or perhaps Southeast, uh, the U uh, Southeast US, things that you wanna look, look or think of are such things as cox coccidiomycosis. In other uh, parts of the world, uh, certainly you want to keep other things on the differential, such as tuberculosis or your uh, other atypical microorganisms. How about this case? Okay, here's a case that uh, a patient was uh, previously fixed at L4, L5, and you can see 
glimpses of the hardware on this sagittal axial view, okay? And we, here we can see the uh, peri screw lucency about the S1 screws. And uh, what we were taught, or what I, uh, what, what I was taught is two millimeters is the cutoff, okay, for hardware loosening. And can we tell, the next question is usually, can we tell between aseptic or septic or infected loosening? And the, and the, the honest answer is that we typically can't. If you're worried about infection, you want to get uh, a needle, tissue, uh, synovial fluid, what have you, and uh, analyze that for possible infection. But you can see here, infections do occur, okay, unfortunately, after uh, surgeons have been in, in uh, bone, and in this, in this case, this was a proven case, okay, of septic, uh, septic hardware or uh, a joint, or you can argue basically a prosthetic joint infection of the sacrum in this case. And as you can see here at the left sacral aisle, this patient is actually starting to uh, destroy bone and even arguably start to form a pathologic fracture at the level of S1 here on the left. So two millimeters, remember that cutoff. And if you're worried about infection, get a needle, get tissue for our pathologists or microbiologists to better help uh, 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 our patients, okay? Or how about this case? Uh, this patient came in with a uh, history of chronic back pain. And what we see here is basically flowing, okay, bone formation between not only the pedicles, okay, but also the spinous processes. And people have likened this to the train track sign when the pedicles are fused, okay? But also the dagger sign, as you can see here, okay, with the one as the spinous, when the spinous processes are fused. Other tip off for this diagnosis is we can see, okay, the superior aspects of the sacroiliac joints are fused in this case. So this obviously a case uh, is of uh, ankylosing spondylitis. And the next thing that you want to confirm is that this person is HLA-B27 positive, okay? Or, or have other uh, potential uh, laboratory markers to indicate this underlying disease of, of, uh, of ankylosing spondylitis. How about this case? And I'm sorry if this projects poorly, okay? But this is a different patient, but the same diagnosis as the previous angst bond patient, okay? And what we see here on the left-hand image, we can see sclerosis at the corners, okay, of the vertebral bodies, the anterior superior corners, okay, of these lumbar vertebral bodies, okay? Or you can say that's enthesitis, where the Sharpie fibers, okay, insert into bone, okay? And also, same diagnosis, but we can see here that in this case, this looks like a, the previously shown monotic arthropathy, or the, that is septic arthritis uh, dash osteomyositis, hyphen osteomyositis, okay? So if you haven't seen this before, this is actually a case of aseptic spondylitis on the right in ankylosing spondylitis, Okay, and these are what's called on the left, so-called shiny corner signs or enthesitis that you get with these HLA-B27 positive diseases or uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies. okay? So uh, one thing to keep in the differential of your septic uh, arthritis, osteomyelitis of the lumbar spine or, or any part of the spine is going to be aseptic spondylitis, as you can see with, with uh, ankylosing spondylitis in this case on the right. Okay, now why does this happen is gonna be the next question. This happens because bone, okay, bone is kind of like me, it's simple-minded, right? There's, you can either, bone re either reacts by taking away bone or laying new bone. And, and as bone as is inflamed at the enthesis, that is the insertion sites of the ligaments and tendons in the case of seronegative spondyloarthropathies, bone reacts by laying down new bone, okay? and if, you, if it lays down enough, enough bone, you start to get the shiny corners. And as it lays down more and more bone, you, got, you start to get the syndesmophytes, okay? Or what's or what we know as the bamboo spine, okay? Of not only uh, bridging the intervertebral disc spaces, but also fusion, as we saw earlier, of the uh, facet joints and also the spinous processes leading to, uh, leading to the train track sign or trolley sign that I mentioned earlier, and as well as the dagger sign, okay? And when it's really floored, it can mimic a seronegative spondyloarthropathy, as in the case of the right. But good, a good thing to remember, okay, is aseptic spondylitis, as can be seen with aseptic spondylitis, or 
um, ankylosing spondylitis, spondylitis. Now, can we tell again between aseptic or septic? Uh, often not, but again, with the history of ankylosing spondylitis, that's, this is one uh, diagnosis you do want to entertain, but if you don't have that diagnosis, obviously the next step would be to, uh, and if the patient looks uh, septic or an extremis, then the next thing that we want to do is to uh, uh, get tissue or um, uh, fluid for further analysis. How about this case of uh, back pain? Okay, and as we can see, the alignment is pretty good. Bone mineralization, the B in our ABCs is, is also checks off and it's, it's, it's good. But we, well, when we trace our C's here, the cortices, okay, we can trace out the vertebral bodies, but what we, know, what we see here is that the pedicles at, at here at L1 on the left is absent, okay? And you should never have what uh, many like to call the winking pedicle or the winking eye uh, uh, staring at, or not, not staring or the absence of an eye staring at you, in this case, winking at you, okay? So this is actually a case, I believe, of uh, metzomyeloma. I think this was a gastric carcinoma going to the pedicles uh, the left pedicle of L1 here. And as we know, this makes sense because the posterior elements, okay, uh, carry a lot of red marrow, okay, and that, that's a that's a, a common site for metzomyeloma to disseminate to in the uh, spine, or that is the posterior elements, okay? So that's one place you certainly want to look for when, uh, when you're evaluating your radiographs. Now, how about this case? patient with low back pain, okay, sort of an eye test. And wherever you practice, uh, I encourage you to uh, know what's in your protocol. And here at, here at UCSD, we typically get a pelvic radiograph along with a frontal and lateral view uh, of the lumbar spine. Now, most institutions just get, or some institutions get just an AP or a frontal view of the lumbar spine along with the lateral. But again, just in our, at UCSD, we do get a frontal view of the pelvis. And what we can see here in this case is the sacrum or the lower half of the sacrum is blown out and enlarged here. Can be arguably a difficult diagnosis, but if the patient is having a persistent back pain, uh, don't be afraid to recommend or proceed to um, cross-sectional image that is CT or MR if it is available and uh, to help better help uh, increase the sensitivity of our diagnosis. And this, as you can see, this patient went on to uh, obtain not only an MR, but CT. And this, an expansile lesion, okay, involved essentially replacing uh, S2 and distally, okay. And this, uh, the, and this was a proven case of chondrosarcoma, I believe it was. But obviously the differential here for your sacral lesions is going to include not only giant cell tumor, but chordomas as well. Okay, so that takes care of lumbar spine. So any questions out there on lumbar spine before we dive into pelvis and hip? <coughs> Excuse me. No, okay. So moving right along, uh, we can do the same thing with uh, our pelvis and hip radiographs. Okay, so starting with the A's, A's okay, you wanna make sure that everything is aligned, your sacroiliac joints are aligned, your pubic symphysis, okay, there's no vertical offset. Shenton's line, which is basically the arc between the, the uh, superior aspect of the obturator ring and the medial buttress of the proximal femur here. You want to make sure that those are also aligned. Almost looks like a, a cane, if you will, okay, or an upside down J, okay. Other things you want to look for, as I highlight here, is you want to trace out the ilium, okay. The rest of the femora, okay. And then obviously here, this, the sacroiliac joints, as I mentioned, you wanna make sure that your iliopubic and ischial lines are not disrupted. If so, you're gonna be worried about a potential column fracture or a fracture of the acetabulum. And speaking of which, the acetabulum, I highlight here the anterior wall and posterior wall. Okay, you, don't want, you wanna make sure that there's no disruption of those lines, especially in someone that presents with, uh, let's say, trauma and hip pain. And then just to round out everything, if you will, okay, that you want to make sure that the rest of the obturator ring, the inferior aspect, particularly uh, obturator ring, is not disrupted. And finally, I want to point out, if you'll notice that the S2 uh, foramen or the superior aspect of the S2 arch, neural arch right here, 
you always want to make sure that that is nice and aligned with the rest of the pelvic or the ischio pubic line here, okay? Because if not, then you want one thing that this may be the first tip off that you may be dealing with a sacral fracture, a subtle sacral fracture, or even a dislocation of the sacrum, okay? So you want to make sure that this superior aspect of the S2 neural arch is lined up with the rest of the iliopubic line all around the pelvis here, okay? And moving on to a, a frog leg lateral view of uh, the right hip here, okay? And we can trace out the rest of our lines. And as we know, this is the greater trochanter, okay? Where the gluteus minimus, okay? And gluteus medius attach respectively, okay? On the anterior and posterior superior facets of the greater troch. Nothing, I remind, uh, I remind us all that nothing attaches on the posterior facet. Oftentimes, we'll, uh, I always have a medical student or, or uh, a young anatomist say that the gluteus maximus attach here, attaches there. But as we remember, the gluteus maximus does, uh, attaches down lower on the proximal and posterior aspect of the proximal femora near, near or at the, the uh, level of the linea spera. So this, obviously, if this is the greater trochanter, this, what's profiled uh, at the posterior aspect of the proximal, proximal femur here is the lesser troch, or that's where the iliopsoas tendon is going to insert. So this is anterior, okay? And this is the posterior aspect of the proximal uh, femur here. So diving right into the cases, okay? We see here dysplastic uh, appearing uh, left femoral head, uh, you can argue that this is uh, coxa plana, or that is flattening and enlarging the coxa magna of the, uh, of the left femoral head here, and also widening of the femoral neck. And this patient uh, presented with chronic left hip pain, okay, and you worry about uh, a patient, perhaps they had subacute uh, uh, leg, leg calf perthes disease, I, I apologize, okay. Uh, in this patient who presented with chronic left hip pain. And uh, you can see that here, the acetabular roof or the acetabular sorcial line is relatively preserved, or that is, it's horizontal, excluding the, uh, the potential diagnosis of the de developmental dysplasia of the hip. And the other thing you would get in DDH or developmental dysplasia of the hip is the uh, compensatory uh, enlargement of the uh, left uh, femoral head in this case. But uh, again, as I mentioned, we don't have the vertically oriented or the abnormal appearance of the acetabulum to support the diagnosis of DDH. So the diagnosis favor in this case of chronic left hip pain would be remote or old uh, uh, osteochondral injury, or that is osteochondrosis, uh, leg cap perthes disease, which can be bilateral in approximately 15 to 25 percent of cases. Uh, uh, young patients, so it depends on who you read, but you want to make sure to image the other side of the hip if you're thinking of this diagnosis, particularly in a kid that presents with uh, uh, hip pain bilaterally. How about this case? Okay, the alignment, okay, the A is good. The uh, C is also good if you trace out the cortices, okay, but what we notice here is this subtle sclerosis, the, bo the abnormal bone mineralization, extending beyond not only the anterior wall, but the posterior wall, the acetabulum. If I told you, if I provided additional history that this person has autosplenectomy, okay, presents with acute chest pain syndrome uh, every so often, okay, and actually we saw this person's vertebral bodies earlier and they were H-shaped, so this is a case of avascular necrosis in a patient with sickle cell disease, okay, and we can see now appreciate this subtle bony sclerosis or this abnormal bone mineralization of the femoral head without obviously collapse of the femoral head yet or secondary degenerative changes. Or how about this case, okay? Left hip pain, and if I told you that this person was a runner or a marathon runner, one place that you want to look for, okay, for subtle abnormalities are, is along the compressive trabecula, okay? That is the weight-bearing trabecula of the proximal femoral femurs, okay? And what we see here is also subtle sclerosis, okay? And arguably subtle lucency in this case, who actually has a subtle stress fracture involving the com these compressive trabecula, uh, okay, of the uh, medial aspect of the proximal femur. So that's one place you want to look for uh, when some, uh, when your patients who are overactive athletes present with uh, hip pain, okay? 
And obviously, if there's abnormal bones, say underlying pagets or an underlying abnormality, you want to look at the tensile um, uh, trabecular, that is the lateral cortices, okay, because you can get stress, abnormal stress fractures there. But typically, those tensile stress fractures are going to be associated with an un, uh, underlying bony abnormality, be it neoplastic or metabolic. So those are some things to think about. Now, how about this case? Left hip pain, okay? And I'll give you, uh, this is, a, uh, this. sometimes these can be subtle findings, but this is just to drive home the point, okay? Sorry, and I need to move this. I'll move this up, I apologize. Okay, but the subtle finding here is this, uh, this subtle, if you will, teat-like or uh, 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 subtle osseous prominence involving the lateral cortex of the left proximal femur. Now, this hit was unfortunately called negative, and the uh, patient went on to CT, and this finding was again mentioned and, and uh, identified. And does anyone know what this case is, this little volcano-like sign or uh, teeth sign or this uh, sort of mound of uh, uh, abnormal subtle bone at the lateral cortex of the proximal femur. Does anyone know what this is? And a patient with chronic hip pain, let's say that they were also on uh, bisphosphonates or, or a drug. So this is, a, this is what's called an atypical stress fracture of the femur. Classically described, okay, with bisphosphonates, okay, which uh, are prescribed for osteoporosis or, or, or patients with low bone mineralization. But what that does is these med medications alter, okay, the normal milieu or the normal interaction between osteoblasts and osteoclasts, laying down in a similar fashion abnormal bone to alberg schoenberg disease or osteopetrosis. But what these patients uh, get are basically is basically abnormal bone. It's not adequately remodeled, okay? And these patients can actually get stress fractures as this patient has a subtrochanteric fracture that was uh, not diagnosed. And believe it or not, okay, these cases can be bilateral in up to 25 to 50% of, of cases, okay, depending on who you read or where, uh, so the one thing you definitely want to do is similar to late cap Perthes disease or other hip diseases, you want to image the contralateral side to make sure that uh, there's not involvement of the contralateral uh, hip or femur. And in this case, this patient did go on to have their subtrochanteric stress fracture fixed, but unfortunately developed a subsequent stress fracture on the contralateral side, which also needed subsequent fixing as well. Okay, and I also like to share this case. Whenever we're dealing with a subtrochanteric fracture, take a moment, pause, okay, and make sure that we're not dealing with an underlying lesion, be, be it an atypical stress fracture in the case of bisphosphonates, or perhaps sometimes we may have an underlying uh, metastatic deposit or myeloma leading to fragile bone and uh, predis predisposition to pathologic fracture. So you wanna make sure Remember, again, when you ever have you have a subtrochanteric fracture, you're not dealing with an underlying lesion that the surgeon needs to know about. Okay, how about this case? Okay, left hip pain that presented to us and rule out a tumor from an outside hospital. That's OSH. And what we see here is exuberant. Okay, osseous proliferation at the uh, left ischial tuberosity. And we were asked to biopsy this, and we declined because this is a case of uh, myositis ossificans or myositis ossificans traumatica, okay? And this patient, if you could have a more history, well, we got a history that this person was a track athlete, a jumper, a hurdler, and had an episode of acute pain, okay? So this is just a simple case of myositis ossificans or heterotopic ossification. You don't want to, we don't recommend biopsying these because if you biopsy myositis ossificans early on, the pathologist will see mitotic figures uh, under uh, histologically and can misdiagnose this osteo, uh, osteous pseudotumor, if you will, as osteosarcoma. And uh, you may, uh, this may lead the patient down uh, inappropriate testing or even intervention. Okay, so you want to recognize this. Okay and uh, ask for a good history of uh, prior injury. 
This uh, leads me into the next uh, slide. And here I provide for us just the attachment sites or insertion sites, if you will, or origins of the various muscles and tendons about the pelvis and hip. But the big one I want to highlight is basically the, uh, is the lesser trochanter, okay? And as I mentioned, anytime you have pathology or perhaps a fracture in this region, lesser trochanter or subtrochanter region, you want to make sure that you're not dealing with an underlying lesion that is mesomyeloma. Okay. Anytime you have a, a, a lesser trochanteric avulsion fracture without a good history of trauma, okay, especially in our older patients, you want to work those work these these uh, uh, fractures up to because these are uh, pathologic until proven otherwise. Look for that underlying lesion. Okay. And here to illustrate that that case, okay, here an avulsion fracture of the lesser trochanter or where the iliopsoas tendon, as we now know, inserts, okay? And this is the case, if you, if you sort of squint your eyes, you can see a subtle lucency in the subtrochanteric region. And this was a case of a gyne cancer. I believe it was either endometrial or cervical cancer, metastatic to bone, leading to this case of a pathologic fracture at the lesser trochanter, okay? How about this case, okay? Subtle bilateral low back pain and hip pain, okay? And what we see here is some subtle sclerosis, okay? And erosive changes of both sacroiliac joints, in this case of sacroiliitis. Now the workup of sacroiliitis, again, I apologize, let me move this down, can be divided into uh, unilateral or bilateral forms, okay? And again, what I wanna point out Anytime you have unilateral or monoarticular arthropathy, the top one, two, or three things that you want to exclude is infection, 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 okay? But as in our case, our case was bilateral, and then once you're on, on, on this side of the algorithm, okay, you want to look at your, you, to see if the SI joints are involved symmetrically or asymmetrically. Because as you can see, that'll lead to different differential diagnoses, okay? How about this case, okay? Similar, okay? A better radiograph, mind you, obviously, but here we have a bilateral involvement, okay, of sacroiliitis. So we are on the bilateral limb of our algorithm, but as I mentioned before, the answer is usually on the film. And what we see here are subtle surgical suture chains, okay, in this patient who had, if I gave you additional history, prior bout of uh, enter enteropathy or IBD or Crohn's disease, okay, so, so we can diagnose enteropathic-related sacroiliitis in this case, okay, of symmetric bilateral involvement of the sacroiliac joints, okay? So this person actually had enteropathic-related uh, sacro sacroiliitis, okay? How about this case, okay? So here we have endosophy or forward osseous proliferation, okay, at the uh, bony insertion sites of uh, various tendons, okay, insertions and origins. Uh, and you could also notice that this patient also has fusion of the uh, sacroiliac joints bilaterally. So anytime you have a floored endosopathy, such as in this case, the top two or three things in my practice that, that, that we always think of are gonna be ankylosing spondylitis, DISH, or that is diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, and uh, fluorosis, okay, uh, and uh, uh, abnormal amounts of fluoride intake, which we don't see these days uh, because uh, water is treated differently, but perhaps you may see someone that uh, uh, gets uh, dental treatments often, but it has been, uh, uh, fluorosis has been described in various drugs, such as boroconazoles and, and uh, various antifungals. Uh, so you can see that. And for those, uh, uh, that the previous patient that is with all the pelvic anthosopathy, this is that same patient. And what we see here is the sedesmophyte formation, okay, causing the bamboo spine here of the cervical and thoracic spine, as we note here, in this case of ankylosing spondylitis with not only diffuse endosophy of the pelvis, but a bamboo spine of the cervical and thoracic spine. How about this case? The patient came in with right hip pain, and we can see that we have complete destruction or complete absence, or we can infer a complete absence of the cartilage here with narrowing and bone-on-bone -bone articulation between the right 
uh, femoral head and acetabulum. Okay, and again, I'd like to highlight, anytime you have a monoticular arthropathy, a monoticular arthropathy, one joint involvement, you wanna make sure that you're not dealing with infection, in which this case was, this was a septic arthritis, osteomyelitis of the right hip, okay? You could, someone could argue, well, this could this be uh, rheumatoid arthritis? It could be, but with rheumatoid arthritis, you would expect bilateral symmetric involvement, right? Other things you want to look for is uh, look at other joints. Notice how the sacred leg joints are, are pristine here, okay? And the pubic symphysis is not also eroded, okay? So that goes, that puts RA or inflammatory arthropathies, non-infectious inflammatory arthropathies, that is lower on the differential. One may also entertain osteoarthrosis, but osteoarthrosis, uh, I would argue that that is not on the differential because given the degree of joint space loss or narrowing that is, where is the osteophytosis or the bone formation, okay, the medial, cor uh, the medial cortical buttressing of the proximal human femur? We have neither of those findings, okay, thereby uh, uh, bringing or placing the differential diagnosis of osteoarthrosis with uh, cartilage loss and hip joint space loss lower on this, uh, the differential. And I think this was a case of, of uh, staff involvement, and I believe this, this patient was also an IV drug uh, user, okay? How about this case? Patient with hip pain, okay? So here, obviously our alignment is good, tracing out the cortices, uh, good, but the bone mineralization, sort of uh, irregular and, if you will, wonky bones again, but again, sort of thickened coarsened trabecula with, uh, and uh, expansile uh, appearance of the pelvic bones, particularly the iliac bones and sacrum. In this case, another case of polyostotic Paget's disease, okay? So you can confirm by looking at other bones, okay? Or even look at laboratory parameters that, I, as I mentioned before, alkaline phosphatase, but basically uh, uh, look at uh, bone markers that indicate uh, increased bone turnover. How about this case? Okay, we have uh, a few expansile lesions, sort of ground glass, if you will, involving not only both iliac wings, but also the proximal uh, right femur here down to the proximal diaphysis. And this patient, as we can see here, actually sustained a pathologic fracture and a periprosthetic fracture for which they subsequently, as you can see here, uh, required plating for, okay? And this is a case, okay, additional CT images. You can see the ground glass appearance of these osseous lesions, and this is a case of, uh, of fibrous dysplasia, okay? So uh, another good thing to uh, keep on our differential for multiple lytic lesions, okay, involving the uh, skeletons, fibrous dysplasia. Now, how about this case, okay? Back, back and bilateral hip pain. There's a known history of thyroid cancer and the uh, I challenge us to find the disease uh, metastatic deposit here. I assure, I assure you that there is a deposit here, okay? And for those that claim maybe there's a deposit here, but I assure you there is a deposit involving the sacrum, but this, I share this case to highlight or emphasize, okay, that it can be difficult to pick up some of these lesions on our pelvic hip radiographs owing to various uh, issues such as patient body habits, perhaps uh, an elevated BMI, okay. Some patients are uh, osteoporotic, as I've shown earlier, and it can be hard to pick up lesions on a background of osteoporosis or osteopenia. And sometimes as well, we can have overlap of normal bowel gas or even abnormal bowel gas in the evaluation of subtle lesions. And in those cases, you want to just proceed, if you, if you can, to CT or MRI when available. So this case, okay, subtle case, but there was a thyroid met to the right sacral alloy in, this, uh, in uh, the previous radiograph and shown here or confirmed on a subsequent MRI of the lumbar spine. We could play a similar game, okay, with this uh, with this patient also presenting with back pain, and I assure you there was a lesion here, subtle, okay, but we can see this sort of modeled, sort of mothing, or even arguably permeative appearance here of the posterior superior leg spine and right sacral ala, in this case of a clear cell chondrosarcoma. So again, if the patient, if our patients have persistent uh, hip pain or pelvic pain, if available. Uh, please uh, consider proceeding to your cross-sectional imaging, okay, as in this case of a clear cell 
chondrosarcoma. How about this case? Another case, another uh, subtle uh, uh, deposit or a lesion, and we can see here this subtle lucency at the right uh, iliac tubercle or at the origin of the tensor postulata muscle, okay? In this case, okay, of a lung cancer, and as we can see here, this patient's PET CT, they have a uh, apical tumor, arguably a pancose tumor. And uh, you can see here that this patient also had involvement of the left subtracanteric region uh, of the uh, left proximal femur there. And finally, uh, I think this is the last case of, of uh, metastatic disease. Another subtle case, what we can see here, or are you here, there's a subtle lytic lesion there, and, and here at the sacrum, but also at L4 and S1. So some subtle cases. So anytime you uh, have a, a persistent pain or perhaps a diagnosis of myeloma or metastatic disease, uh, and you don't see anything on your radiographs, uh, please consider going to uh, your um, cross-sectional imaging if available. Now, how about this case, left hip pain? And just to orient everyone again, okay, this is gonna be posterior. That is the lesser trochanter. And here, obviously, profiled on FOSS can be the greater trochanter. And what we have here is a calcific deposit. And what, you want, what I want you to note, what, what I want everyone to notice how this is calcified rather than ossified. An ossific ossif uh, soft, uh, soft tissue mineralization is going to have cortex uh, and trabecula, or that is monobone. You can notice here in this calcific deposit, it looks more arguably smudgy, more cloud-like, if you will, or more homogeneous and smooth like chalk, if you will. So this a case, as I mentioned earlier, uh, what inserts here is going to be the gluteus maximus. So this is actually a case of calcium hydroxide ap appetite deposition, or that is calcific tendinosis of the gluteus maximus tendon insertion. And this can be quite painful, okay, especially in the dispersive or resorption phase of calcium hydroxyapatite, uh, as the calcium is, is incites a local uh, soft tissue uh, reaction uh, that the host responds to, and this can be very painful. And this is actually treated symptomatically with uh, NSAIDs and what have you. To uh, compare that previous case of calcium deposition with this case, this a case, a large deposit of not calcification, but ossification. And notice in this case that you we actually have cortex, okay, and we have the, this large ossific deposit following a similar morphology to nearby bone. That is, you have cortex, as, as I had mentioned previously, and trabecula. So you would not call this a calcification. Why is that important? Because that leads us down a different, different differential, and this is a large ossification. And similar to the case previously, previously that we saw, the small deposit of myositis significans, this is just a large deposit of that diagnosis. In this case, of a patient who took a football helmet to the thigh and developed this large deposit of heterotopic ossification or myositis ossificans traumatica. Okay, so again, you would not biopsy HO or heterotopic ossification or myositis ossificans because if the pathologist were to get this microscopically and see many mitotic figures, you can see how this could be misdiagnosed as osteosarcoma leading to unnecessary further workup or even intervention in our patients. How about this case? <clears throat> okay, so we kind of talked about the A, B, and Cs, okay? They all look pretty normal, but we see what we see here in this case are chronic, uh, these soft tissue masses with scattered calcifications or ossific density, if you will, overlying both luteal regions. And we were asked to biopsy these, but this warranted no biopsy. And this is actually a case of silicone injection. And these, this is actually believe, uh, done uh, for aesthetic purposes and uh, patients who uh, want to look uh, 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 like celebrities, if you will. Um, they, they, and this patient actually had not only silicone injections in their buttock regions, but also in their, the regions of their breasts for augmentation, okay? And you can see that uh, the, the injection of foreign material can incite granulomas reactions, as in this case, of uh, 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 
cosmetic purposes or aesthetic injections, if you will. So something to think about besides uh, looking at the alignment, the bone mineralization and cortices. Remember, we're also uh, responsible for the soft tissues uh, or the uh, corner aspects or the edges of the films as well. Or how about this case, okay? A uh, patient, a female patient with chronic low uh, back pain and gnawing abdominal pain. And what we have here is a subtle calcification. Notice here the homogeneous appearance, chalk-like, cloud-like, if you will, lack of trabecula, lack of cortices, okay? So it's not ossific. This calcific sub-centimeter density projecting over the right lower aspect of the sacrum. And this a case, and we suggested it, this is a case of a pelvic dermoid, okay? So not everything that presents similar to the previous case is gonna be bone related. And this case actually was a proven case of, derm of a dermoid cyst chronically leaking, okay, the uh, fat into the peritone peritoneum causing a chemical peritonitis, okay? In this patient with uh, gnawing abdominal pain or, and uh, uh, chronic low back pain, in this case was actually taken to surgery and, and the dermoid cyst was removed to, uh, to obviously treat the, uh, the chemical peritonitis that the patient was experiencing, but also to uh, 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 prevent future uh, possibility of ovarian torsion. And finally, I believe this is our last case. Okay, just to drive home the point, if you clear the, uh, the alignment looks good, the bone mineralization looks good, and you trace all our, all our lines, the cortices look good, so the ABCs look good, Okay, but what you wanna make sure is you wanna look, look at your corner shots or the edges of the film. And what we see here overlying the right, sup, uh, uh, right uh, supra trochanteric region uh, or the greater trochanteric region, if you will, you have multiple foci of gas deposits overlying the gluteal regions. And this a proven case of necrotizing fasciitis. Okay, as we know, it can be a rapidly advancing soft tissue infection, but this uh, warrants immediate uh, surgical intervention with the, which this patient underwent. So, so just to sum up, okay, the ABCs, alignment, bone mineralization, and cortices, trace out your cortices. Once those are checked off, okay, make sure you look at the edge of the film and, and clear your soft tissues. And finally, if anything, the takeaway from this uh, talk, anytime we have a monoarticular arthropathy, a monoarticular arthropathy, one joint involvement, okay, you want to make sure to exclude infection, 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 okay? So this is my uh, contact information. This is uh, uh, my email. If you have any questions, feel free, or even if uh, uh, you'd like to share some cases. I do, uh, uh, if, if, if any of you all follow Instagram out there, we do have an Instagram account at UCSD. Uh, and the handle is X-Ray Ted, okay? And we typically show bone cases uh, under X-Ray, CT, ultrasound, and MR. Uh, and also some ED cases uh, under this profile. And uh, if, if you ever have any free questions or any uh, questions and uh, uh, you need an urgent uh, answer, uh, if I'm up uh, uh, Pacific Coast time, US, feel free to text me or email me and uh, we'll do the best we can. Uh, hopefully this talk was, uh, uh, I know this talk was very basic, but hopefully this will, uh, lay down some groundwork for uh, future talks, uh, and uh, I hope to be back. Thank you very much, all. Hello. Thank you, Hello. thank you, Dr. Smithman. Uh, does anybody have any questions? No questions. That's great. Okay. <laughs> so, so next time, I guess if if that's okay with everyone, I'll unless someone um, emails me with a topic that they'd like to hear, I'll talk about uh, bone tumors and pseudo tumors next time and the workup of uh, uh, such lesions. Okay, great. That sounds good. Um, Eddie, this was excellent. And thank you so much for such a fabulous talk. No, thank you. <laughs> let, let me just ask the residents if they have any questions. Please. 
Yeah. Um, Shamla, can you unmute the uh, University of Rwanda residents, Ivan, Dennis? 